So today we'll be talking about uh, the implications and the psychology of misunderstanding and misinterpreting uh, or misusing uh, statistics. So we understood last week that we have a problem with a replication uh, crisis, reproducibility crisis, and this leads to a credibility revolution. And the question is, what went wrong? So how could it be that, that we arrived at a situation where uh, some of our findings are not reliable? Um, and, and it seems to be, so there are lots of issues about this, but it seems to be also a fundamental issue with the way that we look at stats. So if we, uh, in this in this lecture, I have to admit that for me personally, I am very uh, careful, hesitant, and also uh, lacking confidence in my understanding of statistics because I'm I'm very aware of all the issues that there are in terms of our use of statistics. So many things I still feel uh, that I don't know very well. So every time I go over what is a p-value. I uh, freeze a little bit and then I come and it's like, did I really say that uh, correctly? I, w whenever I talk about rejecting the null hypothesis, I, I contemplate what it is that I'm saying because I am aware of all sorts of issues uh, that have to do with the way that we uh, think of statistics. So in, in the upcoming lecture, I use a lot of uh, resources from other scholars and, and they help me kind of explain these uh, concepts. I'm especially going to focus today um, uh, slides from Dorothy Bishop, and she's been talking about the cognitive biases in, in the way that we do research or uh, in researchers, and Anne that adopted some of her slides uh, to uh, make it, I think, a little bit more uh, entertaining. Uh, also some slides from Felix and, and Marcus, from the Manifesto of Open Science. So, so uh, a lot of, of slides from uh, amazing people that have really uh, changed my understanding of statistics. Uh, and uh, among those is Daniel Lackens with his shiny apps and his course. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so uh, here you can uh, see a very common uh, situation that I've faced many times. Uh, so uh, this is a situation where you meet up with your lab and then the PI says, all right, team, we've got negative results. We didn't find anything, no, uh, uh, you know, no findings. What should we do? And then uh, different people suggest all sorts of things like remove outliers, increase sample, do this, do that, in order to try and get this to work somehow. And then uh, me saying, but why don't we submit this anyway? So we've tried, we've designed things the best that we could. We got some findings. These are the findings. Why don't we just submit this anyway? And usually what this uh, leads to is me being thrown out the window. Uh, and so this, this happens again and again. And, and I want to share with you uh, a really uh, funny uh, YouTube uh, video, funny slash sad. Uh, so this is a meme. It's based on some, I think, uh, Spanish, uh, Mexican TV show. So what they've done over there is that they took this scenario and they added subtitles that say something about the way that we academics uh, do research. And, and together it, it makes for a very entertaining, I think, uh, video. So I'll, I'll play that. Hopefully it will go okay. Y me llama el cocinero. Risita, ¿qué? Ve por la paellera. Venga. Ya están aquí. Mira el bañador. En las chanclas. Todo despeinado porque no me dio tiempo nada de ponerme las chanclas y el bañador. Voy a la playa, había subido la marea. Eso. Eso. Oh, 
Ai, Gabriel, não vai me ver sem moura. Colou o bolsaco lá. Ai, java, java, parceirinha. Java, parceirinha. Trai o brinde. No vea, vea, a Sevilla. Me, me, y el último que cuando ya salió la bien de regla, estamos llorando. Me, me cobró el tío la. Me cobró a 500 veces. Y ya no fui más. Me fui andando a coger los amarillos hasta hoy. Me mandó por la noche, había bajado la más el agua y para la mañana había subido. ¿Para quién estaba donde está la paella? A lo mejor está en el, en el barco eso del petróleo. En el prestige. En el petriense. Yeah, so for me, very entertaining and very real, unfortunately. Uh, this is stuff that we encounter um, with, with, with uh, research all the time. Now you, you might think, okay, so entertaining, it's a funny video, somebody took this to the extreme, but I want to uh, make the point that, uh, no, nope, <laughs> this actually happens. How do we know that this actually uh, happens? Uh, we have uh, all sorts of papers that investigated this question uh, just by self-admission. For example, this paper from 2012, are people really doing this? So we asked people, are you doing these kinds of things, all the things that you saw right now in the video? Um, do you maybe know of other people uh, that are doing this around you? What is your estimation of how many people are actually uh, doing this right now? And as you can see over here, at least you have self-admission. So this is the, the, the dark one over here. The, the problematic thing is that if we start like with the worst case scenario, so this is falsifying data, we already have uh, two, three percent of people that admit to falsifying data. This is real fraud with implications. Uh, if this is in psychology, there are some implications, perhaps uh, not deadly, uh, some consequences perhaps with clinical and applied, but when, when it comes to medicine, and this has been you know, showing in, in other disciplines, just imagine what it means for uh, people to 2%, even 2% is a lot. But when we ask people, so what do you think the real estimate is? Uh, and people are saying, I think that the real estimate is actually much higher. Most people say uh, 9%, even, even more than that. But these are the extreme fraud cases. The stuff that we talked about in, in this video, the guy that was making fun of the whole thing, is, is simple things that it took us a while to figure out that, that are wrong to do. Uh, we, at the beginning, like during my PhD, I did not even, nobody mentioned to me that failing to report all depending me measures uh, does anything. So for example, they say you want a clean, uh, concise paper. So why do you add in all this noise and nobody reads the supplementary to just make the, the, the manuscript cleaner? And I could never, never really understand that because some of these DVs, if, it's, if something didn't work, uh, then I think all of it should be reported. If it worked in terms of p-value uh, lower than 0 0.05 supporting the hypothesis or didn't work, you had no findings and failed to find support for hypothesis, everything should be shared. But if you look at this, 78% admit to not reporting all of the dependent uh, uh, variables uh, or they don't report all of the conditions, 42%. Uh, all sorts of other things like stopping data collection after they, they achieve the, the desired result, which also means that they're peaking all the time. So if you remember from last week, uh, feeling the future, so uh, looking, uh, collecting participant, looking, collecting participant, looking. So all this exponentially increases our chances of, of finding a significant result. So if we're doing all these things together, all of these things together mean that very close to 100 participant, 100% of the people who participated in this in this survey, academics, people who do real uh, science, psychological science, admit to doing all sorts of things. And if you look at the actual estimates, many of them are very close to 100%.
So this just goes to show you, 2012, we did a lot of these things and we took it for granted that this is the way that we do science. Um, when we ask people to, to uh, you know, estimate not just about them and their collaborators, but breaking this down to graduate students or researchers in your institution, so you can see, uh, biases that we teach in judgment decision making about better than um, than average or better than others so me i'm great because i've never most of the people say i've never even the once or twice is is troubling to me but people are saying all sorts of things like you know for us we're clean but when i talk to graduate students uh, when i talk to other researchers in my own institution especially researchers outside in different institutions uh, they do a lot more of that. So it seems that we're in an environment, at least in 2012, where people know about these things, but they have a sense that there's something wrong with it because they actually don't admit completely to doing it. And there's also this uh, problematic um, evidence of, of these questionable research practices. A guided thesis, so some of you are going to be doing a thesis or an internship. A lot of students are admitting um, doing all these things, and this is hard data that we can actually see and, and, and look at this. So even this falsifying data over here, uh, selectively reporting studies, a very high rate, close to 30%. So very troubling stuff. You can go on the, on the articles and, and read about this. So this is Richard Feynman uh, over here. Um, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. So. It's not that these are deliberately trying to fool everybody into thinking that something that didn't work actually works, but I think over the years, because of all the incentives and because of all the pressure, we've uh, led ourselves to believe that this is the way that we can do our science and that this is sustainable and reliable, and when in fact it, it isn't. So subconsciously, we've done all sorts of things to convince ourselves uh, that this, um, you know, that, that this is okay. So Dorothy Bishop over here, she's uh, really has some very convincing uh, lectures. And uh, this is a talk that she gave that she published also in a journal. She gave this about the psychology of experimental psychology. So what does it mean to be a researcher? Uh, you know, if we're social psychologists and we're talking about classics in the literature, so what is the social psychology of social psychologists? So it's like a meta meta uh, level. And the interesting thing is that she describes all sorts of cognitive constraints on researchers. So you can see, for example, over here, confirmation bias. And we've done some really nice uh, replications of confirmation bias. And this is a very robust uh, effect that keeps coming up. So the tendency to seek out and remember evidence that supports your preferred viewpoint. So they like to do this traditionally in the US with uh, Republicans and Democrats. So um, people don't really like to face evidence contrary to what it is that they believe. So Republicans seek out information to support the Republican view. Democrats seek out information to support the Democratic view. So it seems like each one is in its own bubble and nobody really uh, tries to uh, fight their own beliefs. But as, as researchers, as academics, it is our duty to try and really give uh, our um, hypothesis the best and most critical test. So we need to be critical of everything that we do, but because we're human, we want things to work. We invested all, let's say that you're doing a thesis this year. So you've invested the whole year, you've planned things and, and you, you invested in data collection and then you've worked with, with your um, professor and then uh, a lot of expectations. So you want things to work out so at the end, if they don't, uh, you perhaps convince yourself, maybe there's something there. Let's just drop a few outliers. Let's just focus on this condition and then it will work. And every year I read thesis, not only in HKU, but also before that, I read thesis where it's very obvious that the students are trying to convince themselves that there's something there. Every year I am a reviewer on real articles and I see many times that it's very difficult for experimenters that have invested so many uh, years in running uh, studies to convince themselves that there's that you know there's something there when in fact it you know the evidence is very is very weak and we'll talk a little bit about that and some real real evidence for that so I want to share with you some of Dorothy and Anne's 
um, amazing slides about publication bias. So is there really a problem with not publishing everything? Why do we need no findings in the literature? That's boring. We don't want to open an article and then read about everything that they've done only at the end to see they didn't find anything. So why do we need to know anything about nothing? So uh, now we have a good understanding of why we need to do things uh, differently. So I want to uh, give you the example of this magician. And the magician is called the Amazing Significo. Uh, and this uh, magician is trying to show you his magic trick. So just imagine this scenario uh, where he comes up with a deck of cards and you, know, you have uh, five cards in a poker sort of way. And he tries to convince you that in one, uh, draw, he can draw five cards and then show you three of a kind. So let's say, for example, here you have three, three queens. But the thing is, is that the probability of, uh, let's say that the deck of cards is unbiased. It's really, it's a, it's a true deck of cards and everything is randomized and everything is transparent. Then drawing three of a kind is kind of uh, rare. So it's uh, one, one in, in 50. So uh, if a magician tells you that he'll deal you three of a kind in a real randomized deck of cards, then you should be really impressed. That's uh, support for him being a, a true uh, magician, support for a phenomena. And he really has some remarkable skill over here. But I want you to consider a second scenario. scenario. And this is where Significa uh, announces three of a kind to 50 different people. So you can see all these people that he's been going. So let's say he goes around here in the faculty, he knocks on the door, he says, I'm going to show you three of a kind. But he goes to 50 different people, 49 of them, they look at the deck of cards and there's no three uh, that are similar. And it's like, you're not a real magician, go away. And then he comes to me, he knocks on my door, and then he says, uh, I'm going to show you this amazing magic trick. And it just happens by random chance that he shows me three. But I don't know that he's been going around the department showing to other people. So for me, this is the first time that I see him. So for me, it's like, oh my God, how did you do this? This is amazing. Uh, but here, the uh, missing piece of information is, it's really amazing if I uh, don't know anything about everything that he did before that. I'm like, this is truly remarkable. But then if somebody comes uh, next door and says, but you know that he went and he showed this to uh, 50 uh, people in the department and you're the one that worked, but all of them didn't. Then I'm like, oh, okay. So maybe he's not a real magician. Maybe this is not a real, a real phenomena. Consider another scenario and the scenario, <laughs> I think is the closest to what it is that's happening in our literature in all of science is that Significo deals you uh, uh, three, three of a kind and then he says that this was intentional. So he didn't tell you in advance what he's going to do. He just puts five cards on, on the table. He looks at those cards and says, yes, this is what I predicted. And then you know, our immediate reaction should be, wait, but how do we really know that this is what you've done. This is what you've hypothesized. We have no indication to know that this is really what you expected. You tell us that this is intentional, but how do we know? We have no idea. So uh, we have to take your word for it. And there's no reason for us to take your word for it because what you're claiming is to be a, a magician. You're claiming this to be magic and we're skeptical. Uh, but right now what's happening in the literature is people are saying, these are the evidence and we knew this all along. So trust us that we knew this all along. There's no way for us to really prove this, but you know, we're academics, so we should be, we should be trusted. So we now know that these scenarios, scenario number two and scenario number three, I'd heard two other good examples of questionable research practices where the selective reporting. So the magician that knocked on my door and showed this to me, didn't tell me that there's 49 others that he failed before. Uh, so some cherry picking, some p hacking, perhaps switching of the, the outcome and also harking. So harking is hypothesizing after the results are known. So um, after the, the um, Significo sees the outcome, then he tells us, oh yes, that's why I hypothesized all along. So after seeing the results, this is when you set your hypothesis. So, we, we want to know if, if there's some indication uh, that this is, this is happening in, in reality. So 
back when I was in my PhD, uh, we're talking 2009, 2014, I read a lot of papers in JPSP, so Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And this journal is remarkable in the sense that really rigorous set of studies. So typical JPSP has something like eight different experiments showing support for a phenomena, and all of them seem to have a p-value lower than 0 0.05. And whenever I looked at this, I said, okay, so this is amazingly strong evidence. Uh, there must be a phenomena over there, and there, uh, these researchers are, are truly phenomenal in the sense that they've been able to show this again and again, every time, with no failures. Now, We've, over the last decade, developed all sorts of tools. So this is here from Daniel Lackens in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Um, and for me, when I was doing my postdoc, I wanted to understand more about the science crisis and, and you know, the way that we use statistics. I went to his workshops and I sat with him and he showed uh, some remarkable things, including this uh, Shiny app. And I want to share some of this uh, Shiny app uh, with you. Okay, so to remind you, a Shiny app is an interface, a really nice interface that runs on top of R and allows lay people like you and I to put in some numbers and then get, get, some, get some results uh, fairly, fairly quickly. So uh, what you can see over here is that it gives you the likelihood ratio of uh, mixed results. So let's say that you have uh, uh, three studies that you ran, but only two of them succeeded. And success over here is a p-value lower than 0 0.05 in the direction uh, that you expected. You can control the alpha, uh, the p-value. So typically the p-value that we look at is 0 0.05, but if you want, you can make it stricter or higher. And then the assumed power, we're going to talk about what power is and, and, and the implications of power, but the assumed power over here, it depends on your research design and your sample size, especially sample size is, is very important over here. So typically back then in 2011, when we had Feeding the Future, JPSP, we have a large number of studies and then we have a large number of successes in those studies. So for example, if we put here, they have eight studies typically and the number of successes is eight, um, then we have eight out of eight, and this is supposed to show a very strong support for, uh, for a phenomena. Now, the problem back then is that the samples were very small. So typically you had 20 people in each condition, the experimental and the control, and the, the average power was even lower than 0 .0, uh, 0, uh, 0 0.25. So if we look at this implication, once we put all of this in, we can, we can look at what, uh, what, what this means. And generally, if you consider that all this is real evidence, then the data is more likely under the alternative hypothesis than the null hypothesis on this kind of ratio. So this is an amazing ratio. So that means this phenomenon is, is uh, tr truly unbelievable. It's, it's a bit like uh, magic. But when we look right down into it, so what is the probability of observing X out of uh, N significant studies, so eight out of eight over here, when there, is a, when there is a phenomenon, given that this is our power. So given that the samples are this small, what is the chance of us uh, seeing significant studies? So uh, the chance of us finding zero out of the eight is about 3%. Uh, one out of the eight, 13%, two out of the eight, 25%. And as we go up, the chances of us finding eight out of eight is very, very, very small. So if this is our power and we're using this kind of very small samples, the chances of us really finding this are remarkably small. They're, they're smaller than, than, than 1%. This means that more likely, when you run this kind of experiment, unless it's a truly, you know, physics level phenomena where you can, uh, you know, have the, the CERN, um, you know, test this in all sorts of very, very precise uh, ways, we don't have this kind of level of precision. And when our samples are this small and the power is this low, uh, it's truly remarkable. It's a magician level um, so, sort of demonstration to find eight out of eight. So. Whenever we see a JPSP from back then with these small samples and eight out of eight work, you have to 
you have to say, no, some, something that's wrong over here. Can you please show me everything that you've done? Is it truly eight out of eight? Or perhaps you ran uh, a bunch of other studies and you're hiding the fact that, that there are some uh, failed findings. But if you see eight out of eight and this kind of really small samples, you have to question things. You have to be more critical of what's actually uh, happening over there. Now I'm gonna show you uh, like what, what, what is the uh, like, so um, what is the likelihood given that we have uh, higher samples, so uh, bigger samples, so higher power. So now we aim, we try and aim for a power of uh, 0.8, 80%. And when we have that, it's much more likely that we'll have more studies at 60, that so seven uh, is the highest likelihood of, of 33%, but still a little bit unlikely that there's eight out of eight. So if you see, an entire journal, and all of it is eight out of eight, even if the power is, is 0.8, you have to assume that there's some, there some problems because it can't be that every article in that journal is, is, uh, is amazing, is phenomenal. There, there should be something like 16%, but it, it should be more of a spread. Some five out of eight, some six out of eight, some eight out of eight, uh, but there's, there's some, some problems over here. Now, here in, in this course and in most of my research, I try to aim for uh, 95%. And when we have 95% power, then it's, it's much more likely that you have eight out of eight, assuming that there's really a phenomena over there. And when we do replications, we really try and aim for 99. And, and even, even then you have 92% of having eight out of eight, but it's very possible that only seven out of the, out of the eight uh, will succeed and in many of our replications it, it happens sometimes that we find the phenomena and sometimes we don't have the phenomena but this in terms of the statistics this is very uh, revealing so you can play a lot with that this is explained in this in this journal uh, article over here there's another trick that has to do with 50 magicians uh, and they announce together three of a kind of different people and only one of the 50 uh, succeeds and I think this represents uh, another sort of uh, issue with publication bias in terms of, so there's this one magician that tried and succeeded just by coincidence because of the randomness of, of the universe just so happens by chance that they found uh, something. But then we have all these 49 other magicians that try to do this sort of thing, but we don't know about them because what they've been doing is that they've been putting things in the file drawer. So they were not even submitting things. And some of them that try to submit, usually what the reviewers will tell them, it's uh, you're not very good magicians because you said that you're going to find something, but you didn't. Uh, you're going to draw three out of uh, uh, five that are similar, but then you didn't show this to us. So this is not really interesting. We don't really need to know about this. So what finally happens at the end is that we have uh, a newspaper or a journal that's filled with uh, the one amazing significant magician that was able to uh, show a phenomenon. But this is meaningless unless we know about the 49 other magicians that also tried exactly the same trick, but failed. Another thing to keep in, in, in your mind is that if you see again and again the same magician who uh, continuously publishes again and again uh, finding these remarkable uh, findings, uh, then you really need to uh, ask yourself what he says about, about the magician. So I want to show you <laughs> that this is, a, this is a very sad thing. I think, uh, is that there are some real life examples. So you, you remember Daryl Bem from Feeling the Future. So a while back in 1987 or three, something, something in the 1980s, he wrote uh, this guide, how to write an empirical journal article. So this is copy paste from his article. And this is what he writes about how you should do science. So planning your article, which article should you write? There are two possible articles that you can write. A, the article that you plan to write when you design your study. So you just followed everything that you've done based on the study. Or B, the article that makes the most sense now that you've seen the results. So it's a little bit like scenario number three, you know, looking at the results and then saying, yeah, it's intentional. And the amazing thing about Daryl Bem is that he says, uh, they are rarely the same and the correct answer is B. So this is a real life example of an article of somebody who is very prominent, 
a researcher that gives advice to a graduate student on how they should write their articles. And he said, what you should actually do is hark. So you should hypothesize after the results are known, after you've seen uh, the results. And then he, he just writes at the end, so uh, psychology is more exciting than that. And the best journals are informed by the actual empirical uh, findings of, you know, uh, open sentence over here. Before writing your article, then you need to analyze your data. Uh, here with, um, you know, some, some other notes on, on this topic that basically try and say, first collect the data, then look what the results are saying, and then uh, write the story uh, or the hypothesis that matches this. So uh, that's unfortunate. But if you think this ended in the 1980s, this is, this is very unfortunate because this is from last year, and this was published in an open science uh, journal. So this is in, in eLife for somebody from Harvard. So you would say, no, we, we know that this is not happening in, in the Ivy League, uh, the top uh, research institutes in the world. But this is Joshua over here saying, uh, point of view, and this is what he writes, tell me a story. In presenting your results, you have to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. What you don't have to do is tell the whole truth. So in other words, you can select the results that you present, as well as the order in which you present them to shape your narrative. So it's not like you should follow some, uh, some plan or everything that you've done, but you can hide stuff that doesn't actually uh, go well with your results. So you need to have a narrative, you, have, you need to have a story. But now we understand this is so wrong, and we thought at least in, since 2011 we have an understanding that this is that this is flawed. But some researchers are still doing this. It took me up till 2017 to understand the implications of of doing that. I've tried to do better in my own in my own research and my research with collaborators and students. Uh, but but I'm I'm still learning. But one thing is clear is that this over here is very, very wrong advice. So what you can see, the nice thing about eLife is that it really allows people to have comments. So you can see uh, this blue thing shows that somebody left a comment. And this is David over here uh, says, selective reporting strongly biases our understanding of the way that the universe works and borders on scientific misconduct. So just imagine that somebody that set out to give advice to graduate students in this article actually exposes that the way that he writes articles is by not presenting the whole truth, by shaping up a narrative. So that's unfortunate. It still keeps on going right now. So this amazing significa, um, you know, this phenomenon of publication bias, you would ask yourself, so does this really happen in the literature and how do we know? Uh, and we know because when we look at our journals and we look at our findings, the rates of positive results supporting rejecting the null hypothesis, p-value lower than 0 0.05, we have since the 1950s until uh, Anne over here, the one that I took the, uh, borrowed the, the slides from. Uh, so. Uh, 97%, 96%, 96% and 96% of all of our findings are, are significant. So that makes absolutely uh, no sense. And this shows a real problem with publication bias. And we really need to fix this by opening up everything. Uh, now I'm going to go into something a little bit more technical um, about failures to understand sampling and probability. Uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to participate with me in a quiz. And it's not really a quiz, there are no points, it's just for you to try and test yourself. And I just want to share with you that the first time that Daniel Atkins gave me this quiz, I really was not sure myself. And there was a whole debate where we were 20 scholars sitting around together in a table, and we, we were very confused by this. So I'm going to ask you to, um, hold on, so where did I put this? Okay, not this. Okay, here we are, sorry. You can't see all of my screen. Okay, so if you don't mind uh, going again to Mentimeter and putting in this uh, number over here, so 66, 33, 86. And then I'm gonna ask you some questions about your intuitions of statistics, and then we can discuss, uh, we can discuss those together. So let's assume that we have, um, 
you know, an experimental condition and a control condition. So we're running an experiment and we're trying to compare in a between design, um, you know, in, in our, our, our T value, uh, T statistics is 2.7, our degrees of freedom are 18, and then we find P value equals um, 0 0.01. So my question is, uh, what do you say about the statement? Uh, this means that you have absolutely disproved uh, the null hypothesis. Uh, yes, no, or I'm not sure. So keep in mind about this uh, p-value over here. Uh, p-value is the indication. So when you read the journal article, this is the kind of stuff that you see over there. And you really need to ask yourself, so what does this p-value mean over here? Does it mean really that you absolutely disproved the null hypothesis, that you found uh, conclusive evidence in support of your alternative hypothesis. Yeah, so it seems that you have um, some intuitions about this, five of you. Whereas about eight of you are not really sure. Okay, good. All right, so this was, uh, so remember this, this statement over here. So this means that you've absolutely disproved the null hypothesis. I guess the, you can say the majority says no, but there are some people who say yes, and then a lot of people are saying, I'm not really sure. How about this next one? So it's exactly the same statistics. So we still have this p-value uh, 0 0.01. Does this mean that you have found the probability of the null hypothesis being true? Does this say anything about the null hypothesis, whether it's true or not? Now, whenever you, you say uh, no, uh, try and think of like, what is the reason? So what is it in the sentence that bothers you? If you say yes, uh, then, then try and understand so in your mind, try and say, so how, did, how do you go from this p-value or the statistics in order to say something about the null hypothesis? What is it that you're saying? Here there seems to be a majority that says, no, I haven't. We'll come back to this. Okay, let's try this next one. Uh, same statistics. This means that you've absolutely proved your experimental hypothesis. Okay, so there seems to be some consensus over here. So I think definitely this uh, absolutely proved uh, seems to be very uh, convincing to people in that it's a no. Uh, so that's interesting. Okay. Good, thank you. Let's move on. Does this mean that you can deduce the probability of the experimental hypothesis being true? means the alternative hypothesis is being true. Can you say, just by looking at this number over here, what is the probability that the alternative hypothesis is true? Okay, some confusion, two, 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 three, two. Yeah, so this is a little bit more tricky because now we're not talking about absolutely proven or disproven. This already captures a little bit more of the number in terms of the probability. So now we're talking about probabilities. So this is a little bit more confusing. So now you think about this, does this p-value really say something about the probability of the experimental hypothesis? Okay, terrific, thank you. So this is, I think, the most balanced that we've had so far, I believe. So about four of you say uh, yes, six say no. Okay, same statistics. Does this mean that you know the probability that you are making a wrong decision if you reject the null hypothesis? It's a slightly different framing. It's a tricky one, uh, but see if this fits more with what you think about uh, when you think about p-values. Knowing the probability that you are making a wrong decision if you reject the null hypothesis. Hmm. Yeah, this one's confusing, isn't it? Yeah. All right, so more of you are saying, yes, I have. Okay. Huh, 
So definitely this seems to be the closest uh, majority, I think this is the highest that we've got so far in terms of nine of you thinking that this is perhaps gets to the, to the point of, of the, the p-value. Okay, uh, I think this is the last one about uh, replicability. Uh, so when you see this uh, p-value over here, what does it mean for uh, the ability to replicate, to find the same results if you repeat something? So this means uh, that if you repeat the experiment 100 times, you will still get the same results 99% of the time. Oh, okay, so it seems to be a consensus over here, a strong consensus uh, that this is not true. Okay, so it seems like in the last few, many of you have shifted from I'm not sure to either yes or no. So as the questions you know, moved on, I think you found, um, you found a little bit of what this might be and what it is not. So that's really interesting. So thank you for, for playing along with me. <laughs> this, is, this is interesting and I have to say really, it's not, not me being humble. This was very <laughs> confusing to me. And it still is to some extent. Um, so I think it will not be a great surprise to you uh, to realize that, you know, in this kind of quiz, so the quiz is, this is how we usually show this in a, in a survey. So let's say that you have an independent means test and uh, this is the kind of the result that you have. And this is the survey that we give with a true and false when it's done on Mentimeter. And then I think it doesn't come as a, as a great shock and surprise that all of these statements are false. <laughs> and, and why is that the case? And I think some of you uh, perhaps um, were, were onto this. So whenever you have something that says you have absolutely disproved or you have absolutely proved, um, then there's, 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 of course, this is not the way that uh, things work in, in uh, statistics. So you can accumulate. Uh, some data, but you can definitely never say uh, that you've that you've uh, conclusively uh, rejected uh, the no hypothesis. Um, and I just want to say that in many papers that I review, and sometimes in thesis, in in students' thesis, this is uh, people use p-value as an indication that we have proven our hypothesis. You haven't proven uh, anything. You have shown support for rejecting the null hypothesis that indicates some support for your alternative hypothesis. But this is, you need to be very humble and move away from papers that you uh, that use uh, prove uh, in, in, in the way that they describe statistics. So uh, all sorts of problems with statement number um, uh, two, uh, I think this is five and six. And then in, in, despite wishful thinking, the significance test does not and cannot provide probability for a hypothesis. So it doesn't say anything about the probability, the probability uh, over here, sorry, uh, four and five, these probabilities. Uh, the last one over here, the, the sixth one, is that it's, it's, a, it's a fallacy. And a lot of people, I uh, think, take the p-value to say something about whether you're able to replicate something in the future. And this is really, uh, not the case. It's a nice fantasy, but you cannot really use the p-value in order to say anything conclusive about the replication rate. Definitely nothing as conclusive as 99% of, of the occasions. There's so many other factors and the p-value is just not meant to be used in, in this kind of uh, way. Now, you, we, we can go and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what p-value really stands for and what p-value means, but I just want to tell you that you're not alone in this. I felt really bad at the beginning when I, I failed uh, um, many of those, when I got this wrong. But I want to say that when you give this typically to psychology students, and you can see over here this paper from 2004, you give this to psychology students about 44 uh, out of 44, 100% uh, fail at least one of these uh, questions. So you say, Okay, maybe it's students. So we don't expect much from students and especially psychology, they don't have a good understanding of statistics, but we expect more from professors and lecturers. So this is someone like me that doesn't teach statistics and has a uh, limited experience with, uh, with statistics as a background. Um, and we, we did just as bad. So some of us 90% um, fail in, in a sample of, of 39. But I think the most surprising thing over here is this one over here on the right. So when you think about professors and lecturers teaching statistics, 80% of them uh, get at least one answer uh, wrong over here. Um, 
Now, if this is not shocking enough for you, so this uh, paper came out last, uh, last year in Advanced in Methods and Practices in, in uh, Psychological Science. And, and the, the title of this paper is Failing Grade, 89% of introduction to psychology textbooks that define and explain statistical significance do so incorrectly. So they opened all sorts of introduction to psychology um, textbooks and, and they did this in, in a, a very large sample and uh, seems very conclusive in terms of uh, representation of all the, the textbooks that we have. And it seems like a lot of them uh, had, had errors. What kind of errors? So all these fallacies, all these things that we just covered in terms of misinterpretation of the p-value. So you can uh, later look on this fallacy in the description. But the bottom line is that so many of them failed in terms of the definition and the explanation and overall the rates are just uh, ridiculous in terms of them using these fallacies. So, it's not only that our intuitions of what the p-value is are wrong, but also our instructors are teaching us uh, these things wrong. And when we look at the books, because we trust the books, the books are teaching us uh, p-values wrong. So it comes as no surprise that you have a lot of people that are abusing p-values. And it's not deliberate, it's just like really bad training uh, about a misunderstanding of what p-value really uh, represents. So what is a p-value? And the p-value, I'm just looking at this as the one statistic, but there's all sorts of other issues with all sorts of other statistics. And this just goes to show you how complicated statistics is and why we might have a problem uh, with science. So this is Daniel Lackins over here. You're very welcome uh, to go on his blog and then look at his uh, YouTube channel where he shows some videos from his course on Coursera very popular course that tries to help people uh, train the statistical uh, intuitions and inferences of how to do uh, science, especially if you plan on being a graduate student, if you plan to do anything with statistics in industry, then I really recommend that you go and uh, enroll. It's free, uh, these two courses by Daniel Atkins, and he really makes the case you can run simulations uh, in R and he will take you step by step in order to train you to understand statistics better. So this is the definition of what he says about uh, p-value. And I've seen the discussion online and all sorts of people trying to attack this from all sorts of different directions. But this seems to be uh, in consensus that this is as close as we can get in terms of uh, our understanding of, of a, a p-value. So a p-value is the probability of the observed data under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So if you assume that there is no effect, what is the likelihood of you observing the data that you're observing? So if you see a phenomena, you're saying, uh, I, I'm seeing a phenomena, but my assumption is that there is no phenomena. How likely it is that I'm looking at, uh, at, at this data and really seeing uh, this, this kind of uh, support for, for a phenomena. So it says uh, things about the probability of a data. It says uh, nothing about the probability of a hypothesis. So uh, given the data that you have, what is the probability of you observing this under the very important assumption that the null hypothesis uh, is true. So it says something about the, you know, the randomness and the likelihood of you observing a phenomena given your assumption that there is no phenomena. So hopefully this gets uh, clearer that this is not about you know, testing a hypothesis, but this is more about uh, uh, you observing the kind of data uh, that you have given all sorts of assumptions that you have in, in the background. So he lays out all the misconceptions about uh, p-value. So for example, a very common error that I see in thesis and as a reviewer is that people are saying, okay, p-value is higher than 0 0.05, therefore we have proven that the null hypothesis is true. This is not the way that null hypothesis significance testing works. This is not what a p-value means. It can't say anything about proving the null hypothesis. There are other ways to quantify support for the null hypothesis. So you can uh, use equivalence testing or you can use Bayesian statistics, but this is not something that you can do with a typical null hypothesis significance testing with this uh, p-value given the way that it is. Uh, a significant p-value does not mean that the null hypothesis is false. It just means that you've found some support given the evidence that you have uh, that, that the, you know, uh, deviating from, from the null hypothesis to reject uh, the null hypothesis, but it could be that later on you'll have something uh, to see that the null hypothesis, actually there's, there's evidence 
uh, that, that fails to uh, reject the null hypothesis. So there's all sorts of things over here. It's um, kind of nuanced, but uh, you can go over this later in detail and then enroll in Daniel's uh, courses. Now I want to take you into a brief explanation of a combination of both uh, p-value and uh, power. So we usually uh, look at p-values, but it's very important that we also consider the power, and I'm going to explain why. So this is a very brief um, uh, video. Don't worry if you can't get all of it. I'm going to explain this in a little bit more detail afterwards. Unlikely results, why most published research is probably false. Scientific findings are considered sound if they are unlikely to have happened by chance. But statistical logic shows that errors are rampant. Consider 1,000 hypotheses to be tested. Not all of them will be true. Perhaps only 10% will. In this case, 100. But sometimes, random error makes a hypothesis that is really false look true, called a false positive. Most disciplines accept the possibility that this happens 1 in 20 times. So 900 negatives produce 45 false positives. If there were 100 real positives and 45 false positives, then almost a third of the results that look true would be wrong. But it's worse than that. There is a second type of error, truths that the scientists miss. Even a well-designed study may fail to spot around 20% of the truths. In this case, that means 20 true positives become false negatives. So now, the researchers see 125 hypotheses that look true, of which 45 are not. And a false negative rate of just 2 in 10 is very good. It might easily be 4 in 10, or in some fields, 8 in 10. In that case, more than twice as many results that look true will be wrong. The negative results are more reliable, but are rarely published since scientists don't get much acclaim for telling people what's false. Yeah, so that went by pretty fast, but I like the way that they visualized uh, this whole thing because it really uh, kind of captures the essence of uh, the issue of us ignoring that there's two types of errors. It's not just the p-values, uh, there's also a power, and these two work together in order to give us overall uh, the, the kind of the kind of error uh, that we have. So uh, one thing to ask yourself is um, Let's say that you have a p-value of 0 0.05 This leads to drawing wrong conclusions what percent of the time and typically when I give this to others uh, The answer is what do you mean p-value is 0 0.05 and it captures the error rate. So you have 5% But the answer is it, it actually varies and it depends on all sorts of on all sorts of things And I'm going to try and explain to you uh, how. So it could be that you're uh, up to 35% error. Now, in order to understand this, you need to understand uh, type 1 error and type 2 error. Uh, so it could be that the null hypothesis is true in reality, and then you find uh, some support for the null hypothesis, and then uh, this is accurate, or you find support for the alternative hypothesis, and then the alternative hypothesis is true, and that's accurate. But you have two sources of error, type 1 and type 2. Now, I always confuse uh, these two, so I really like this visualization over here, these, these images, in terms of type 1 error is a false positive. So if you see a man and uh, claiming that uh, the, the man is pregnant, is definitely uh, positive in terms of pregnant, false in terms of that this is a man. Now, in terms of a false negative, negative means uh, you're not pregnant, so uh, say, saying that there's no pregnancy, but it's very obvious that this woman over here is, is pregnant. So this is a false negative. Now, if we look at p-values and power, p-values only capture the false positive uh, rate, but there's also the other type of error that is reflected in power, which we typically ignore. So if you remember the Daniel Lacken's um, Shiny app that I showed you about the likelihood and all that, you remember how, how important it was to play with the power because it really shifted the likelihood of you finding uh, significant um, studies. Now, typically, I, I forget uh, the type 1, which, we, which is type 1, and which is type 2. So I use this um, old child story that I've been taught when I was growing up in Israel. And I think there's a similar story in Chinese culture as well. So there's the story of the boy who cried wolf. 
So the boy lives in a village and he goes out and he screams that there's a wolf, there's a wolf. And then uh, the villagers come out with uh, the shotguns and, and the weapons and everything to, to fight the wolf. But then they see that there is no wolf. Uh, and then again, the kid comes out and he yells, wolf, wolf. And all the villagers again come out and they want to fight the wolf, but there is no wolf. And the third time, the kid comes out um, yelling wolf, wolf, but there really is a wolf, but the villagers don't believe the boy anymore, so they don't come out. Uh, and then uh, the poor boy uh, gets uh, gets it. So uh, over here, the null hypothesis is, is that there is no wolf. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a wolf. So the type one error is the first thing that this kid did. So the villagers believing the boy, although there is no wolf, so rejecting the hypothesis incorrectly, this is a type one error. But what happened in the end, the third time, is the villagers not believing the boy when there's actually is a wolf, that's a type one error. So whenever you don't remember which is type one, which is type two, it's a good story to kind of come back to because it really keeps the order. Now I want to uh, talk about the implications over here. So I'm going to uh, look at this example of both power and p-values when uh, the p-value is uh, the typical one, uh, 0.05, so 5%. And power, this is what we aim at right now to achieve 80% uh, power. So what does this mean? So we have significant findings and not significant findings, and we have true and, and uh, not true. Um, so whenever we have uh, half and half in terms of uh, what's true and what's not true, so we have 100 out of 200 that are true, 100 out of 200 that are not true. So in terms of p-values over here, what this 5% captures is that when, when uh, things are not true, we're going to find significant only 5% of the time. So we have five studies over here. But when there is uh, a phenomenon over there, when things are true, we're going to find significant 80%. So this is the power over here, 80% of the time. So what we're gonna do over here is we're going to sum this together 85%, 115%. What we can see is the error rate. So this is a, a type of error. So error of five out of 85, so this is 6%. Uh, going to get this wrong, so it's 20 out of the 115, so this is 17%. And when we look at all of these miss ratio overall, we have 25 out of the 200. So this is an error rate of 12.5. So even if our p-value is 5%, actually our, our um, uh, miss ratio is about 12.5. Uh, and this is with typically good power. So back in the day in JPSP 2011, the power are much lower. So the power used to be 35%. What happens if we do all these calculations with 35%? What we get is about 35% error rate. So it could be that we have this p-value set to 5%, but the power really influences this. And you can see that the lower the power, the higher the, the error rates. Nowadays, we aim for 95% power. And only when there's 95% power and the p-value is, is 0.5, then we have a 5% uh, miss ratio error rate. If we aim for higher power, actually, it goes below 5%, and we can get to a 3%. And we try in our replications as best we can to reach a power of, of 99%. Now, we understand now all the issues with a p-value, so we're trying to move away from p-values, and uh, this is why uh, we try to look at different kinds of way of quantifying support for hypothesis. And in recent years, we've moved to what people call the new statistics, uh, looking at effect size and confidence intervals. So we'll have a little bit uh, on that in the tutorials, and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on. Um, we prefer effect size because p-values, especially this 0 0.05 arbitrary criteria, you either find support for rejecting the null hypothesis or you don't. But effect size is not dichotomous. It's not a yes or no, but it gives you a measure of strength. So you can say 0.2 is lower than 0.5, and then you can compare different strength. So it's not just saying yes or no, it's just saying now you can compare, you can assess this kind of impact with this kind of impact. You can make all sorts of, of um, you know, interpretations of this. You can say uh, point 0.2 in my discipline is considered to be a weak effect, but then in other disciplines, you're going to say point 0.2, that's actually a very meaningful effect if it can help save lives or if it can help uh, save a lot of money when the, the sample is, is, is very uh, large. 
So uh, there's all sorts of, of things about uh, the way that we uh, interpret uh, correlations and all that. Because of our time is limited, I'm going to uh, skip this for now. I really recommend that you play this game over here. It's called uh, guess, the, guess the Correlation. So I'm going to uh, just very briefly show you that. Uh, to guess your, your understanding, uh, to get a, a little bit of your understanding of, of correlations, so you can uh, sign up for that and, and uh, play a game, and it looks a little bit like uh, the, old, the old games back in the day. So you can do a new game over here, and it shows you this distribution of a correlation, and you can just look at this and say, so what does this look like? Like, what kind of correlation are in this? And it takes some time, even for the most experienced people, to look at this and say, oh, I think the correlation is this and that. So a correlation goes from minus one, which is negative, zero, no, no correlation whatsoever to uh, one. And when you look at here, you can see sort of like the line, the regression line uh, over here. And this is just based on what it is that, you know, just like looking at this, it looks like a, a that's a strong, so I lost a heart. And actually it's uh, the true R is 76%. And then you can uh, play a little bit. This looks a lot more random. So maybe something close that. That is the way. So, uh, you can play with this and see what it is that you uh, uh, learn from this. After a while, you will get better and, and, and better at this, and then it will give you the mean error of how much you got, you got things wrong. What does this look like to you? I don't know, 0.2. Yay! So I got a coin, and, and now I'm getting better at this. And if I get enough coins, maybe I'll get another heart over here. All right, so in the tutorials, perhaps they'll go over some uh, um, simulations of what is a correlation and what is an effect size. I really recommend that at home, you, you play around with this. It really helps to train your uh, intuitions. In the remaining time, I will very briefly go over the misaligned incentives. So just explaining what the implications are over here, where we only uh, look at p-values and we don't look at, at power. So I call this misaligned incentives. What is the problem of us incentivizing uh, discoveries uh, and publications over incentivizing uh, reliability of science? So I want you to consider this uh, case study over here. So let's say that in this department, we get two candidates, uh, two PhD students want to come and become professors at HKU. And then we have these two candidates and they both spent five years doing their PhD. Now assume that in their studies, they both had a participant pool of 2,000 participants each year, uh, and they both tasted uh, a hypothesis, 50% uh, true hypothesis, and then they had comparable research designs, and then you have an effect size uh, of 0.5 coins D. Now imagine that you have these two candidates, one of them published 33 statistically significant uh, papers, and then the other one published 21 statistically significant papers. So look at these two candidates and you ask yourself, which one of these two candidates do I want to hire? Now, I think uh, if you pose this question to anybody, ask your PI in the lab that you work in, which one would you prefer? Most of the people will immediately say, what do you mean? The candidate A published 33 statistically significant papers. Of course, that's so much better than 21 statistically significant papers. But this is not the case because if you consider this, because they had the same kind of resources, they both had 2,000, they needed to spend you know, investigating a phenomena. Whatever it is that they tried to test, they needed to spend this kind of participant pool in, in, in to try and, and investigate their phenomena. So candidate A, in order to get 33 statistically significant papers, uh, had to do uh, only 25 per condition. And then candidate B, 21 uh, statistically significant papers, had uh, 100 per condition. And the implications for this are, is that because the sample size, the power of candidate A is much lower, then the ratio of false positive is much higher and only 25% of the results can be replicated in exact replications given all sorts of estimations uh, on, on, this, uh, uh, on this data, on this uh, information. So uh, the person, the candidate B that published 21 statistically significant papers, 6% is false positive, but uh, a lot higher rate, 76% of the results can be replicated in exact replications because the power, the sample size was uh, much higher. If you want to read more about this sort of simulation, uh, you should go and, and have a look at this uh, paper over here by Will, and we'll discuss a little bit more of Will's work uh, later in the course. 
Finally, I want you to consider these two uh, journals. So we have uh, one journal, uh, it's a fancy journal of shocking results with a very high impact factor, but this journal has very small uh, samples, data lost, several failed replications. So I think this really uh, is very similar to the JPSP, at least in 2011. But then you can consider all these other journals that are open science that have everything pre-registered, large samples, open data, open materials. And then uh, to me, when I try to publish the things that I read, my assessment of what's reliable, I much prefer the lower tier journals uh, that do everything right rather than the big shocking uh, results, fancy journals uh, that do everything wrong. So rather than looking at impact factor, I suggest we move away from this and just look at what the uh, journals are actually uh, doing. And this is a real problem in the way that we hire uh, people overall. Finally, the last thing that I want to share with you is this tale of two papers. If you remember Michael Inslet, so Michael Inslet is the person who shared his story about ego depletion. And this is another thing that he shares in a blog post. And I really recommend that you go and read this. And it's a tale of two papers. Actually, it's exactly the same paper. This is the original version that was submitted to the journal. And this is a typical JPSP. So they said, we ran seven experiments and seven out of the seven were significant. And, and uh, effect sizes are all relatively uh, large. And then finally, when the, this paper was reviewed, they asked them, please move away from you know, perfect findings and just share everything that you've done because this is too perfect. Did you do anything else? And finally, the revised version, after they asked them to open up everything, it turns out that they didn't just run seven, they ran 18 of those. So 11, they just neglected to uh, report because they were not interesting enough. And then two out of 18 were significant. So there's these five um, studies that when you looked at the results and when you shared everything, including the outliers and all the conditions, then you realize they're not really that significant. So this is closer to the truth. This is reality. Reality is messy. It's very difficult to find support for our phenomena. But just imagine what would happen if this is what we had in the literature. It's very, very difficult to correct the literature after this kind of perfect paper, wrong paper comes and is published. So hopefully this will get you to reflect a little bit about what it means, statistics, publication bias, about combining both p-values and power, and just make us a little bit more humble about the way that we think about statistics, about the way that we think about uh, research. So when we read an, an article, is it too good to be true? Is it too perfect? Uh, if it is, uh, we need to be critical. Can they share everything? Can they open up? Did they report everything that, that is required? So if we have all these biases inherent in the publication system, in the way that we do research, uh, no wonder that we're now facing this kind of crisis and we really need to clean up our act. So finally, sorry, it took me a little bit longer. Uh, by next class, I have these two requests from you. Uh, register for the HKU Qualtrics account. This is the link over here. And I will send a link to the quiz uh, tomorrow. And then I ask that by the end of the week uh, that you complete this quiz on the syllabus in order to take part in this course. So hopefully uh, end of the ADRA period uh, for this course uh, is this week. Um, I really hope that you got a taste of what it is that we're going to do in this course. The first two lectures were very uh, technical. In the next lectures, we're go gonna combine a little bit of both the open science and a lot more about uh, social psychology and discussing some of the literature. So hopefully you'll stay in this course, uh, complete the quiz, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.